So glad that you've chosen to join us in our online worship again this week. But I must say, I'm looking forward to when we can get together in person. And we have a plan in place. We can't set any dates yet, but we're working on a, a plan to be able to get together in worship. But in the meantime, we are able to, to worship online. So again, I'm glad you chose to join with us today. I know Pastor Dylan's going to be bringing a great word that's, that's going, to, it's going to challenge you. So I, I really hope you listen to it and hear what he has. But before we do that, it, it's good that our praise team has been able to get together and record a few songs. And, and let's just worship a little bit before we get into the word today. All right, we're going to sing praise for our good God. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
whatever situation you're in. Just worship him today. You see, life as everyone knew it had, had now changed. The, the government knew that they would have to recover a struggling economy. And yes, the new world is what everyone was trying to adjust to. Now, I know what you're thinking. Yes, that's the exact world what we li that we live in now. But I'm actually not talking about today. See, I'm talking about a, a time in history that was many, many, many years ago. It was a time when these people from Judah had been brought into exile. Now, maybe you don't know much about the exiles from Judah back in this time. So let me just give you some, some knowledge about them so you kind of understand uh, more, more about them. So God's people had stopped seeking his face. He warned them time and time and time again to turn back towards him, that they continue to reject him. And God's judgment was now on his people. And because of that, they have been taken into captive, brought away from their homeland, and now under the ruler, rulership of King Nebuchadnezzar. The people of this time were living in a new normal, and what was next for them seemed to be in question. Now, as I already said, this, there's, there's so much comparison from this time to the time that we're living in today. I, I don't believe that, that God sent this virus uh, to judge us or, or anything like that, but, but life as we know it has now changed. We're trying to adjust to this new normal, trying to figure things out. And so here I am, 
I guess it's my turn, right? I guess it's my turn to, to stand up on a stage and, and preach the typical COVID-19 message of, of God's going to get us through this and I'm supposed to encourage you. But see, that's not exactly the area and the approach that I want to take this morning. You see, because what I believe is that as we've been dealing with this, this virus, we've kind of lost track of two important factors that we're supposed to that we're supposed to hold on to in this and it's a responsibility factor and an opportunity factor so this morning what i want to do is i want to i want to tell you that that we have a responsibility in this time of isolation and god wants us to stop playing this thing with, with with a survivor mindset but he wants us to get in the game he wants us to play off it so if you'll stick around to the end of this message i'd like to challenge you but first i want to i want to give you a a new perspective of your exile into quarantine and so let's let's talk about these exiles see they, they have been taken into captive as we said but but in Jeremiah chapter 29, he writes them a letter that I believe changes everything. And this letter was, was God's word to these exiles, giving them instruction of their responsibility that they had during their exile. And so we're going to read Jeremiah 29, beginning with verses 4 and 5. It says, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Before I read the next part of the verse, here's what's happening. God is trying to get his people's attention. He wants them to know who's talking because what he's about to say is so crucial, so critical, so important. And so what are his very first words of the letter? He says, build houses. And settle down. He says, build houses and settle down. You see, God was trying to give his people instruction of what to do in their new life. And the first thing he says is settle down. Here's what I think God was trying to communicate to his people. Stop worrying to the point where it's crippling you. It's not our job to figure out what's next. And here's what I think was most important and God really needed to get across to his people. He was simply telling them, be present. Be present. And the same is true for us. This time of isolation, this quarantine, it did not take God by surprise. He already knows what it looks like on the other side. So let him worry about that. We need to be present. Now, I just told you that this message wasn't one of those where I was just going to encourage you and tell you, hey, we got to get through this and God's going to pull us through. And that's true. I, I do want to I do want to end this message later on with really challenging you and giving you this new perspective. But I think it's so important that we grasp that concept first of this time of isolation, that we need to be present. Because if we can't be present, we will miss out on what God wants to do in the now. We have opportunities now that we've never had before. We have responsibilities now that we've never had before. And it is important that we stay in the moment and execute these responsibilities. So before I get to that challenge, I just want to give you two more encouraging truths that we need to hold on to. That, that gets us in the right mindset leading into the responsibility and opportunity that we have in our exile. Skipping ahead to verses 10 and 11, it says, This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to you bring, to bring you back to this place. Here's the first truth. God was specific. God knew exactly how long this was going to take. He said 70 years. And we've already mentioned it kind of. I don't, I don't know how long this isolation is going to last, but God does because as we already said, this did not take him by surprise. 
But check this out. God says when the time was up for the exiles, he was going to come to them. He was going to fulfill his gracious promise and bring them back. And we have to believe that the same is true for us in our exile. That God is going to come to us. He's going to fulfill his gracious promise and he's going to bring us back. Now, I'm going to say it again, because I think when we hear stuff like this in church, a lot of times what happens is we just let it run through our minds. But, but God said he's going to come to them. He's going to fulfill their gracious promise, his gracious promise, and he's going to bring them back. Now, I need you to view this promise with the perspective of who God is. God said he's going to come to them. He's going to fulfill his gracious promise and he's going to bring them back. My question is, do you believe that? Do you believe that God is going to come to us? And he's going to fulfill his gracious promise. and He's going to bring us back. Now, the fair question when you when you start realizing that that, that, that God actually does want to do that, a fair question arises of what in the world would be God's promise in a time like this? What would God be promising us? Skipping ahead to verse, finishing verse 11, actually. Um, th this, this could be what the promise is that God's trying to tell us. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Notice what God says here. God tells his people, he says, for I know the plans I have for you. God didn't say, for I know the plans that I had for you. And God didn't say, for I know the plans that I'm going to have for you. God says, for I know the plans I have for you. He spoke in a very present tense. This is why, because earlier we said that we need to be present. You see, the reason that we need to be present is because that's where the promises of God are. We need to stop looking at how life used to be and, oh, God had all these things lined up for me and all these promises, but, but now things have changed, so I don't know what the promise is anymore. And we need to stop looking ahead and saying, well, I, I wonder what, God, what, what promise God's going to have later on and how, how, how God's going to adjust to this, the, the promises he has on my life, how they're going to adjust. But here's what I need you to see. The promises of God have not changed. The promises of God have not changed. They're right here in the presence. And church, that is why we need to be the, in the present, because God's plans for us remain the same regardless of situations, regardless of circumstance, and regardless of any crisis or virus we may face. God's promises remain the same. God has had a plan for you since before you were born, and it's the same plan that he has for you right now, and it's the same plan he's going to have for you when all this is over, because the promises of God remain the same. So let's 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 recap a little bit what we've what we've learned so far. We've learned that it's important for us to be present. And we know also that this this whole this whole exile pandemic, whatever you want to call it, it, it's not taking God by surprise. And we also know that the promises of God are also present. And I think God really wanted to, to get these truths across to these exiles and to us right now because he knew what he was about to tell them was so important and so critical. So as we read these next three verses, I want you to notice the, the boldness of the language God uses. Notice how specific he gets with his people and notice what he's challenging them to do. Verses 12 through 14, God tells his people this. He says, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Now here's what I 
Here's what I gather from these three verses of why God would use such bold and specific language. I believe that God was up to something big. God knew that he needed to prepare his people because he was up to something big and major and powerful. He wanted to get his people's attention because, don't miss this, they had a part to play. He told them to call upon him and pray and seek him with all of their hearts. And look at what he said the result was going to be. He's going to listen to his people. He's going to be found by his people. And he's going to bring all his people back out of captivity stronger than they were before. In other words, he's going to move in a big and powerful way. And church, I can't help but believe that God is preparing us in the now, in the present, for something major. Here's why I believe that. I believe that because the presence of God is being brought into the home more than ever before through online services. More people are being reached by the gospel as what typically would take place inside the walls of a church as it's now being spread across the realms of social media platforms. Generally, more, there's more time for stillness and time to get to know God. And God's people are turning back to him as they realize he is the only answer. I believe God is up to something big. I believe God is up to something major. And we have a part to play in the present. I know what you're thinking. Uh, this is probably, I, I can't help but, but think that this is not an accident, that, that, that God's using this. Now, like I said, I don't think he caused it, but I do believe God's using this to prepare us. And in 1986, David Wilkerson, who's the founder of Teen, Teen Challenge, said this. He said, I see a plague. This is, remember, this is 1986. He said, I see a plague coming on the world and the, the bars, churches, and government will shut down. The plague will hit New York City and shake it like it's never been shaken. The plague is going to force prayerless believers into radical prayer and into their Bibles. And repentance will be the cry from the man of God in the pulpit. And out of it will come a third great awakening that will sweep America and the world. Here's what I believe. I believe God is preparing us for something big. It's something we've never seen before. He's going to move in ways that we didn't even think were possible. And the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out in ways that we could never even imagine. But church, we, we have a part to play. And I don't, wanna, I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of it. I don't want to miss out on what God is doing. God is looking for his people to turn back to him. See, the, the modern day version of this message from this letter can be found in, in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen when he says this. He says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And so church, my challenge to you this morning is simple. What I want you to do is I don't want this to be a, a, another simple message telling you that, that, yeah, it's important to pray and it's important to read your Bible and it's important to fast. But see, what I, what I think a problem is with many believers is they do these things and, and they, 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 they pray and read and, and fast and all this, just expecting God, just, okay, God, just, just touch me. And the problem is so often we're seeking a touch from God. We're, we're waiting for God to seek us out. But the problem with that is our God's already sought us out. Our God has already called us, called us. And so what would happen if we shifted the perspective of our prayers and stopped praying and, and, and stopped studying God's word and stopped fasting just so we can wait for God to touch us? But what if we had the mindset of, I'm going to touch God? Like the lady 
who had the issue of blood reaching out to Jesus. Can you imagine if she just stood there and said, okay, Jesus, touch me when you're ready. But no. See, what happened was she went after Jesus because she knew if I could just touch Jesus, I'll be healed. Church, what would happen if we started trying to come after God and just touch the hem of his garment? What would happen if, if we started to pray bold and specific prayers to the one who has all authority in heaven? What would happen if we started to dive into the word of God and let it soak into our spirits and affect and change our lives? What would happen if we started to fast and seek the face of God and seek to, to know the pureness of who he is? See, I believe that, that God is on the move. God is ready to make something shake in this world. But church, we have a part to play. We have a part to play. We can sit back and just say, you know what, God? Do what you want. But what would happen if we started being intentional and going after God, recognizing that God's promises are for the now, recognizing that God has something right here in the present for us, and we started going after God? And so, church, my challenge to you this morning is simple. We, we need to prepare ourselves for a move of God in a way that he has never moved before. We've got to break the walls of our comfort zone. And we've got to put our vocal faith into practice. Church, if you're exiling the quarantine, you have a responsibility, but it's a responsibility that's an opportunity. An opportunity to prepare yourself for what God is going to do. Wow, what a message. Responsibility and opportunity. That's a Christian's life. The opportunity to serve him, the responsibility to live a life in the present, knowing God has a victory. God has a hope. God has a promise for you throughout this and through this and after this. I hope and pray this message has just touched your heart and that God moves deeply upon you in your service and in your life. Let's pray. Father, bless these men and women, these young people. Bless each that's heard your word. Let it be received and let them act upon it with the fruit of your presence in their life. I ask in Jesus' name, amen.